Pocahontas Coal Mine is located in Tazewell County in the Appalachian Plateau region of Virginia. Pocahontas Coal helped Virginia grow economically after the Civil War. Here we are at the Pocahontas Coal Mine. This coal was world famous. It was the best coal in the whole world. This coal mine is also the very first coal mine that is called an exhibition coal mine, which means you can go in and view it. Because it was the best coal in the world, it was the official coal of the U.S. Navy. And this minefield is absolutely huge, but we're gonna go deep down into the coal mine. That's why I got our hard hats back on. And we're gonna show you guys around the coal mine and show you exactly how hard these guys had to work to make a living. Let's go mining. All right, boys and girls, here we are at the entrance of the mine. Well, the first thing that I had a question about was how do they continue to breathe? Because when you're digging into the mine, it's going to obviously cause you not to be able to have oxygen. Well, from what I found out, they installed this huge, huge fan. This fan would blow the air. And at the other end of the mine was another fan pulling out the old the dust and the bad air. So good air coming in, bad air coming out. This was a very sophisticated system back in the time. So here we are in the coal mine, and you know, a long time ago, this whole area used to be a huge bog, kind of like a swamp, um, and dead animals and dead plants kind of just accumulated inside that swamp, and then mud and, and rock on top of that, and finally all the water was squeezed out, and all this hardened up into what you see now, which is coal. And this is bituminous coal. There's actually three different types of coal. Um, but as they dug through this um, coal, they would find pieces of those old ancient plants and animals. So this is actually one of those old trees that has hardened into a rock. So this is rock, but it used to be a tree. It's called a petrified tree. And it's a real privilege that I'm able to touch this because there's petrified trees out in Arizona and it's against the law to touch them. Boys and girls, it's kind of nice being in this particular mine because this mine is 10 feet tall. All mines are not created equal. Most mines, six feet would be considered a very nice height. But most of the mines would be anywhere between three and four feet tall. They would have to get down very low and do their mining, a very difficult thing to do. And because this mine was so extraordinary, Thomas Jefferson, who did a very good job keeping journals, wrote about this particular mine and how amazing the coal seam was that he saw. So outside is the spot that Thomas Jefferson actually wrote about, and so they've preserved that part of history here at the Pocahontas Coal Mine. Boys and girls, working in the mines was very, very dark. They didn't have electricity for lights, so working in here, you wouldn't be able to see anything. But since I have Frank with a light, we have light now. Some, these are some of the same exact conditions that miners would be working in if this mine were still open today. I've only been in here less than a minute. I've already bumped my head four times. Good thing I had this Trekker hard hat on. The miners back then, I'm sure they bumped their heads a lot too. They worked in very low conditions. Boys and girls, one type of rock that you study in fifth grade is called sedimentary rock. A great example of sedimentary rock is also down here in this mine. On the roof of the mine, you can see an outline of a fish fossil. And that fossil's been here for many, many years. And over time, the fossil makes an imprint so we can see the outline of the shape of the fish. Coal is formed when plants and animals die and are buried by layers of sediment. As the layers pile up, the pressure and heat turns it into coal, which is then mined. And you can see the petrified wood from the old trees and the fish fossils that the trekkers saw when we went into the Pocahontas mine. So I'm here at a typical coal seam where a Pocahontas coal miner would come. And his day would start out by getting down on his hands and knees with a pick, and he would have to dig this out two feet from the floor of the mine, two feet up, two feet back, and he would get about eight to 10 feet in length. So he would have this big, huge chunk of the, the seam carved out. And what he would do, that might take him an entire day. And you only got paid by the amount of coal that you pushed out of the mine. So at the end of the day, you didn't have anything to show for your, your work because nothing went out. So the next day, he might come in and grab one of these bad boys. And this thing is probably a good 40 pounds. Here, take this. 
put it on his belly, like this. Lean into the mountain. And twist and twist and twist. Turn this thing all the way into the mountain. To dig his, to put his holes in, because he's about to blow this part of his coal seam up. Once you get done with that, and by the way, you have to dig more than one hole or drill more than one hole. He might, for his eight to ten, um, eight to ten feet, he might have four or five holes drilled into the mountain. So what they do is they fill up a tube with black powder, stick it in here, light it, and then get out of the way because all that coal is gonna, it was gonna explode the coal seam. And because he dug that whole uh, trench out in the bottom, the coal would just fall to the ground. And then he would have to come back in, start lifting everything up onto the coal carts. And remember, he only got paid for what came out. So he might bring in his own kids to help him load the coal, because the faster you loaded the coal, the more money he made. Here's a little hole in the wall, and this is where the early miners would eat their lunches, kind of in just holes in the wall. And lunches actually caused a big argument back in those days, because everything was covered with dust, and you couldn't see whose was whose. So sometimes they had problems with that, and not just from other miners stealing their food, the rats tried to steal their food. Um, and those rats were smart. They adapted, they had some behavioral adaptations. Because first of all, the lunch cans had a hook on the top, and the, mice figured, the rats figured out how to curl their tails into that hook and pull the lid off. And so they took away the hooks, and the, then the mice learned, after about seven years, it took them to figure out this, they could wrap their tails around the lid and pull the lid off that way. So the miners kept having to change the way they packed their lunches to keep the rats out of it. And those rats back in those days were almost as big as a small dog. But you know what? They didn't want to get rid of the rats because the rats could save their life. They wanted rats around them because if there ever was something happening in the mine, the rats would sense it a lot earlier than the people would, and the rats would go running, and the people would go running right after them. Well, Dave talked about the eating. Well, also stored here were baskets. Not baskets for food, baskets for anyone who may have gotten hurt. So if someone may have passed away, they would load the body onto these baskets and pull them out. There was a line waiting at the entrance of the coal mine because folks wanted work, they needed work. So they would send the next person in to replace that person who was no longer with the coal mine industry. There were three orders. The coal mine operation said the most important was the coal. The second most important, what do you think it was? Well, you may be surprised. It was the mules. And the third most important, the people. Hmm. What do you think about that? Stinks! <laughs> As you can see, the mining company didn't know his treat the miners right. And here's another example of how the miners were treated unfairly. Here I am standing outside the company store way back from the 1880s. That's why you see it's all falling apart. It actually crumbled last year when they were trying to restore it. But this is where all the miners used to have to go to buy things. They were not paid with money. They were paid with credit at the store. And so what they would do is they'd go here and they'd buy all their food, their clothes, their furniture, all right here. Unfortunately, the back of this building collapsed in 2007 and mines could also collapse. Frank's gonna tell us more. All right, so now we've got the mine dug, and you can see that we're in this big, huge area. Well, the roof could collapse on us at any time. So to keep that from happening, we'd, make, we'd have to support the roof. And this, as you can see, is a tree. Now, the mining industry uh, back then was a little crazy, and the trekkers are having a little problem trying to get our minds around exactly how the mining company got away with everything that they got away with. Because the miners, in order to keep themselves safe, had to support their own roofs. If they, and to support their own roofs, they had to go and cut their own lumber. And remember, they only got paid for the amount of coal that went out. So if they spent the whole day cutting trees, zero dollars coming into their home. But as you can see, we had a tree sitting here, and we, this would support about three feet of roof. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, that does not sound like a whole lot of roof. And Brad's going to show you uh, one of the modifications that they made to this system. This is something that's really cool. Frank was just showing you the timber to support the three feet of roof on his side. Look at this side. This was what's called, and it's still called today, it's called cribbing. If you look, there are pieces of timber all in here, and it creates a really dense, um, massive timber structure that supports the land above it. 
There was many, many dangers, and one of the dangers was explosions in the mine. There were lots of explosions. One huge explosion happened where when the explosion just ripped through the mine, the east end of the mine, it came all the way through. And remember those fans that we're talking about, those big fans to get all the good air in? It was so powerful, it just blew those fans right on out. And it caused a big amount of problems. 114 people were killed in that particular blast. That's 114 people that were on the payroll. It was probably a lot more than that, but 114 people that we know of. I'm standing in front of the Button Company, uh, Coffin Company, and believe it or not, this guy used to be a cabinet maker. And Alfonso told you about the huge explosion that killed all those people. Well, because all those people died, there were no coffins. So the mining company told this guy that he was no longer making cabinets, and he had to make coffins for all those people. By the time they cleaned out the mine, there were no more coffins, or there were no more bodies to be buried in those coffins. So they ended up putting all those bodies, or the body parts, in one large trench. And from that point on, he was the undertaker, which means he had to take care of all the mining accident victims and bury them in his handmade coffin. So you can see that coal mining was very dangerous and you had to be brave to be a coal miner. So where do these brave coal miners come from? Alfonso is going to tell us more. Hey boys and girls, who do you think worked in the coal mines? Well it wasn't just Americans. We we're talking about diversity. We we're talking about folks from uh, Poland, Lithuania, um, Czechoslovakia all around the world. They would come in, they'd arrive in Ellis Island, New York, and then they would come and find a job here at the coal mines. Yeah. And they said here in the coal mines, everybody's one color. And you know what color that is? Black from the coal dust. So what race you were really didn't matter here in the coal mine. We had unity and diversity here in the coal mines. Assuming you made it out of the coal mine without an accident or a death, you would come here to shower up and clean up. We were told that if you went to your house, you would have to take a bath because you didn't have showers in your house. And it, as dirty as you were, it might take 10 baths to get you clean before you stop turning your, your bath water black with coal dust. So you would come here and take a shower. Uh, we were told that this is a foot bath because they had lots of uh, disease that they would spread around because everybody that lived in this town worked here and had to shower here. So you would clean your feet here before you came into the shower, you shower up. You would shower in your clothes because your clothes were all covered with uh, with coal dust. You'd come out, and then Brad's gonna tell you what you would do with your clothes. What would you do with your clothes after you just showered in them? Well, the coal miners they would hang those up right here because in this shower room there was actually a boiler system to provide heat. So now that they have taken a shower in their clothes, they clean the coal dust off, and what they're gonna do? They're gonna hang it up right here, and it's gonna raise it up to the top and have the heat rise during the night to dry their clothes to be ready for the next day. Remember in the intro I said how big this mine was? Well if you had to walk all the way to the back of the mine, that might be most of your day. Because you had to walk back out as well. So they had these, coal, these, these buses that would take you all the way back to the back of the mine. And you can notice that it's, it's not very tall because the roof wasn't all that tall. And well... I got a couple of stowaways in here, and this is how the guys. Hey, good work. This is how the guys would get back to the back of the coal mine. And as you can see, they look nice and comfortable. Um, there would be lots of arguments and fights in here because the guys would. Because the guys would sleep on the way in, and they were not all that comfortable with all these guys sitting so close to them. So lots of fights and all that. There's some footholes up there that they tried to use to keep the miners from from beating each other up in the tunnel. Hey, boys and girls. <laughs> You know, funny your room. The next time you want to complain about your school bus trip, don't. Because the miners had to go to their work, and sometimes it would be up to 10 miles. This mining operation extended maybe up to 10 miles long. So if they were on the very last trip, 10 miles, that took a while. Can, so, you, can you imagine riding like this for 10 miles? Well, boys and girls, we hope you enjoyed your trip to the Appalachian Plateau. And I'd like to thank our brand new friend here, guest trekker, Amy, for giving us a tour of the Pocahontas coal mine. And we thank you guys for coming, and we'd also like to see you come out and see us in Pocahontas for dinner. Well, the snow is still coming down, and it's getting mighty cold out here, so we're going to wrap things up. Be sure to check out VirginiaTrekkers.com for more podcasts. Keep on trekking!